It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. We go on a deep dive in the new Chrome 85. We'll talk about problems with the credit card standard, EMV. And then Steve's going to talk about a fingerprint technology that doesn't use cookies and is much more accurate. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Security Now comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they're working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 782, recorded Tuesday, September 1st, 2020. I know what you did last summer. This episode of Security Now is brought to you by Worldwide Technology and Cisco. When was the last time your company updated your security strategy? Are your business assets protected? WWT offers security solutions and services that will protect every endpoint of your business and help you combat even the next-gen threats. Visit WWT.com slash twit to get started. And by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is ridiculously fast. You can stream everything in HD quality with zero buffering. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash security now. And by LastPass. Let LastPass improve your employees' experience while safeguarding your business from cyber threats. LastPass is the number one password manager. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. It's time for Security Now, the show where we cover your security, your privacy, your safety online. With this guy right here, the man in charge, Mr. Steve Gibson. Hello, Steve. Yo, Leo. Good to see you. Great to be with you for this first day of September. Where has the, well, I know where the year went. It's Ugh. been uh, I hope it goes a little a faster. Let's uh Let's move it right out. <laughs> no, no, no yeah, need. Yeah, I want to. I would like to be in my uh, time machine and jump these next two uh, months up to uh, the the, uh, the beginning of November. But I wouldn't mind jumping two years at this point. We've got to move through September and October first. Yeah, yeah. Um, the. Uh, I wasn't sure when I when I titled this show that that the title just popped into my head when when I realized that the fun thing to talk about would be some updated research which was originally conducted the first round in uh, eight years ago in 2012 about the degree to which an analysis of our browser's history, just a static analysis of our browser's history can disambiguate users from each other. That is, where we've gone tells uh, anyone looking who we are. So of course, I know what you did last summer is the name of this podcast this week. Um, and we're going to take some deeper dives into fewer topics uh, this week. Sometimes we, we just like quickly cover a bunch of stuff. I wanted to look at a bunch of the new features offered in Chrome's latest update okay. that we talked about last Tuesday, Chrome 85, just as it was coming out. And, and oddly enough, I had to go into about Chrome last night on a system that where I've been using Chrome off and on through since the last week, but it still hadn't kicked into its auto update for whatever reason. Um, uh, we're also going to take a look into the fascinating details of a recent, as in last week, culminating last week, but pretty much through the month of August, attempt by Russian sourced individuals to co opt and bribe an employee of Tesla. Uh, the details are interesting. Uh, also, some sobering security research which successfully circumvents Visa's point of sale pin protection, allowing purchases of any amount with a stolen Visa card and just completely bypassing the need for a pin. Wow. Uh, we're also, we have a bunch of uh, closing the loop feedback with our listeners, uh, which, some of which is really neat, and some miscellany. And then we're going to, as I said, examine this 
oh, not only was there research from eight years ago, but it was just updated by a trio of researchers at Mozilla uh, a week ago. So uh, a bunch of neat stuff to talk about. And we also update a our picture of the week, which was humorous. <laughs> and which we showed uh, earlier this year, like I don't remember, like maybe no, like late March or April, it showed a timeline of the way the COVID-19 pandemic had changed the importance of things like a j sudden jump in, the, in, in toilet paper and a, a gradual increase in the use of the Internet. A pretty straight line need for coffee, but alcohol consumption uh, increased. Anyway, it that, that picture has been updated. Uh, <laughs> kind of wonderful. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is one more item to really put it over the top. <laughs> <laughs> it's just every time I look at it, Leo, it just cracks me up. It's so perfect. It does. It's really it's our life. Well, we yeah. know what you did last summer and we know what we did last summer. We were here busy. Yeah, but uh, and boy, the security uh, landscape didn't didn't change things much. Uh, our sponsor for this segment of the program is Worldwide Technology, and uh, they are, as you probably know, I hope you know by now. We talk enough about them. Uh, a great partner in enterprise technology, whether you're buying or installing or integrating. If you need a consultant, they also are there for your security needs. WWT. Uh, our show today brought to you by Worldwide Technology and Cisco. Of course, we use Cisco Umbrella. A lot of uh, Cisco tools are really great for this kind of thing. WWT offers you security solutions and services that will protect your business. And the real question is, boy, you hear these ransomware stories and you just, I get chills. How prepared are you? The attackers are constantly updating their techniques, their strategies. Are you? Worldwide Technology is there to help you. Prepare for today's threats and the next generation threats that are coming tomorrow. And that's what you really want. You want a company that's not going to rest on their laurels. It's not going to coast. A company that has the vision, the service, the capabilities, and, and really the drive to protect you, to deliver security controls, reduce the risk for your organization, to keep up with the state of the art. And that's what WWT does. Their team... It provides the resources and platforms that help you protect your business. With over two decades of experience, they have a proven track record that will truly help you succeed. In fact, I've, I've got a couple of case studies. I love the case studies because WWT has been doing this for more than a decade. They have many, many, many clients, many, many case studies. In fact, you can go online at www.wwt.com slash twit and read more. But I'll just give you a couple just to get you in the mindset, they worked with a very well-known large healthcare organization. Now, healthcare, right? HIPAA, uh, even though HIPAA compliance has kind of been relaxed during COVID, still, if you're a healthcare organization, security's got to be paramount. I hope it is. Um, they helped uh, this large healthcare organization uh, conduct a security risk assessment of their certified electronic health record technology. That's the stuff with all the information on it you really want to protect. WWT's consultants used expert knowledge, <clears throat> the, the latest state-of-the-art tools, in-depth analysis, skilled training with the, with the staff and employees, and repetition to complete their assessment. And here's the good news. 90% of the vulnerabilities, virtually all, that they could they found were could be fixed by simply putting in a comprehensive systematic approach in place for patching. That's if you listen to the show, you know that that's like job one, right? So they really helped this company get that working. And they worked with a retail bank, big name, to help them achieve their primary goal of establishing an infrastructure capable of preventing and sub sub surviving they, they call it a catastrophic cybersecurity event. You can imagine what that might be. WWT helped them reduce system outages by 40%, and they saved money. They were ongoing cost savings of 48%, and they did that through automating infrastructure. That's the kind of thing WWT can help you with. Endpoint security, improving visibility and compliance while defending at the edge, network security, protecting your network traffic, decreasing your attack surface, improving threat detection and response, just reducing overall cyber risk. 
They can help you with identity and access management. We talk about that a lot, of course. Ensuring the right people and devices have the right access at the right time. They also do what, and we've talked about this before, Google started doing really changing the way people think about security and trust. You know, many companies still to this day, and perhaps yours, assume that everybody out there is untrusted, everybody in here is is trusted. Google said, no, that isn't going to work. They created the zero trust architecture. WWT can help you implement that as well. Build a next generation security architecture based on strong identity management, encryption, trust no one, segmentation to thwart the most advanced attacks. This is the kind of uh, security stance you have to take these days. You cannot assume that everybody in your network is 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 a good guy. <laughs> that should be obvious. There's so much more WWT can do for you. And and no matter what the field you're in, no matter what your business, how you make your money, security's job one. It has to be. That's why you listen to this show, right? See how WWT can protect your business assets and intellectual property with a holistic security approach. They're the best. Go to WWT.com slash twit. Get yourself started. Let worldwide technology help you. The greatest greatest team really stay on top of this stuff wwt.com slash twit wwt delivering digital outcomes and modernizing it infrastructure all over the world okay back to steve and our picture of the week let me i'm gonna have to make some room on the screen for this one so uh people are gonna have to check out the show notes if they're curious to see this suffice to say um, we, there, that this thing tracked from March through June, uh, the relative importance in 2020 so far was the title of coffee, of your car, of the internet, of shaving, of alcohol, of toilet paper, and of sweatpants. And remember, you know, the, like the need to shave dropped down because <laughs> you didn't have to be going to work every day. There was this weird toilet paper shortage uh, when suddenly everybody was going to be staying home and worried about how long they were going to be there. And so people over-purchased toilet paper, thus creating sort of a, a synthetic shortage of it for a while. Um, of course, the Internet grew in, in importance. Cars dropped importance dramatically because people were not commuting. Sweatpants cre uh, increased in importance because you didn't have to get dressed. And after all, no one can see you from the waist down. So if w w when you're using a, a Zoom conference, you're like, no, I've, I've got my pants on. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anyway, the point is that <laughs> a, a last item was added, which was the relative importance of masks. And what's so funny about this is that it looks like the, the walk of a drunken ant uh, on, on the paper. It's sort of up and down and goes around in circles a bit and it does a peace symbol at some point. And, you know, it's just wonderful. So anyway, I, I thank a Twitter uh, follower of mine for sending that to me because, yes, I'm sure he remembered that we showed the original chart, which was fun also. But this is just kind of hysterical. So thank you. Um, last week, we talked about Chrome 85's release that day, uh, which would, among other things, fix a worrisome remote code exploit, which uh, existed in Chrome's WebGL rendering engine. Uh, but I said, among other things. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes to enumerate the other major changes that landed last week in 85. Um, in this day of massively heavy web pages, as we know, speed is paramount. And as we've spoken of many times, Google has really focused to their credit and to the Internet's benefit on measures to increase the user's perceived browser speed um, just across the board, uh, going so far as to pioneer new Internet communication standards like the Quick protocol to enhance connection performance and the operation uh, after a connection has been made. So, you know, big props and, and hats off to Google. 85, which we've had now for a week, introduces a new compiler optimization technique known as PGO, standing for Profile Guided Optimization. Um, it 
uh, in independent page loading benchmarks has shown a measurable and significant improvement in the browser's overall performance. That is profile guided optimi uh, optimization. Chrome's engineering director, Match Max Kristoff, said, because PGO uses real usage scenarios that match the workflows of Chrome users around the world, or, uh, of Chrome users around the world, the most common tasks get prioritized and made faster. He added, our testing consistently shows pages loading up to 10% faster at the median and even greater speed improvements when your CPU is tasked with running many tabs or programs. So essentially, PGO makes it possible for the browser's most performance critical code to run faster. Um, you know how browsers now have JIT, uh, just-in-time compilers. Well, they're they're just in time, meaning that uncompiled code is compiled as it's needed. But it turns out that if you take a little more time to better optimize that code, which is being compiled on the fly, the result, not surprisingly, is a much better page experience. And so essentially, they're no longer treating all just-in-time compiled code equally, they are using um, some, some compile time heuristics and some history of it in order to understand that it makes sense to take more time to better optimize this code which is being compiled just in time on the fly. So this ends up producing some great results. Uh, there are two benchmarks which are are often used. One is known as the first contentful paint, first contentful paint, which is the the interval between the start of a page load and the browser's first display of any of the page's content. So of course that that goes a long way toward describing the user's perception of how long they're waiting for the page is like, oh, good, you know, here comes the page. Stuff is beginning to show. Um, it measured a uh, browser improvement of up to three and a half percent. And uh, there's something known as the speed meter browser benchmark, which clocked an 11.4 improvement, as well as an overall 7.3% improvement in the browser's responsiveness. So, you know, we just got that for free and presumably eventually all Chrome instances, that is all the other browsers that are Chromium based, uh, will get that as well. Um, and there's also an interesting new emerging new lossy image compression format known as AVIF. Uh, it is able to outperform WebP, JPEG, PNG, and GIF, or GIF, uh, and it's intended to eventually replace them all. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I loved this, the, this uh, graphic of the AVIF image format support. This is something that anyone who tracks which features which browsers have will be used to seeing, uh, there's uh, among all of the different browsers, IE, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, iOS, Safari, Opera Mini, and Android, there, uh, and, and showing a stack of their various versions, there is exactly one green rectangle, which is Chrome 85. In other words, Chrome as of, uh, actually was as of, yeah, it was as of a week ago, now is the first browser and the only browser at the moment to offer support for this AVIF format. Um, but again, as other browsers update their Chromium instances, we can expect more widespread, uh, widespread support shortly. This, this AVIF is AV1 image file format, which compresses using the AV1 codec 
and has been found to dramatically reduce image sizes without a significant loss of quality. So it's it's what you want. It's fewer bits describing a picture with equal crispness. In tests that were conducted by Netflix using AVIF images, they found that AVIF significantly reduces a file size while retaining high leverage, uh, high level image detail. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, image size matters to Google because, of course, big images are going to take longer to load. Um, Google wrote, reduce bandwidth consumption to load pages faster and reduce overall data consumption. They said AVIF offers significant file size reduction for images compared with JPEG or WebP. Prior to full optimization, Netflix published results on their test showing 50% savings versus JPEG across use cases and going past 60% for images that were RGB. Um, so anyway, uh, it's compatible with high dynamic range images and sites such as Netflix, YouTube, and Facebook have shown an interest in its use. So not surprisingly, Google decided to build in support for the file format. And I expect we'll see others, even non-Chromium browsers, following suit uh, before long. Uh, for anyone who's interested uh, in learning more about this, uh, there's a link in the show notes. I put a link in uh, to the Libre software uh, uh, site, which uh, has some very good background about it. Uh, over on the security side, about a year and a half ago, back in April of 2019, as part of their overall pro HTTPS march, Google signaled that they would be tightening up their alerts and blocking of mixed content downloads. As we know, mixed content refers to any page asset which is fetched over these days HTTP from a base page that was fetched over HTTPS. For a long, for a long time, only so-called active mixed content was being blocked and passive content such as images uh, and like MP4s and things. That is, for example, not an iframe, uh, not JavaScript, certainly. Th those are very active. So, but passive things were perceived as being much less worrisome uh, and could just be allowed without comment. Uh, this was also likely a consequence of the fact that many sites were still continuing to pull some resources over HTTP. I'm sure that Google's analytics demonstrated that if they, uh, you know, 18 months ago started just putting their foot down about HTTP load of lo loading of passive content, it would break a lot of things. So today, or last week, with the release of 85, Chrome has started displaying a visual warning whenever mixed content audio, video, uh, or images such as PNG, GIF, JPEG, uh, and, and even uh, MP4 videos are downloaded. Chrome is also now blocking other mixed content files that are considered unsafe because they could be abused to deliver malware, such as PDFs, Docs, DocX, and XLS and, and, you know, their like. So assuming that this move last week doesn't result in some sort of a surprising, you know, end of the world as we know it, where many more things are being blocked and causing problems, the next Chrome 86 is expected to block across the board all mixed content downloads, period, making no discrimination about, you know, what their nature is. So, you know, this is the, the, the essentially this is Google saying, OK, uh, we know that it was a pain to switch to HTTPS, but pretty much everybody is now. And boy, I'll tell you, anytime I do something that is not HTTPS, 
uh, it's increasingly difficult. Like, you know, for example, uh, we, we, Leo, you and I were talking about sync thing. Well, when you, you know, if, if you're just talking to a web browser on your LAN that you're looking at across the room, you know, there's arguably very little need <laughs> to connect to it securely. Right. But boy, does it complain, you know, Chrome. Uh, if, if, if you try to, to you know, talk to an HTTP thing or, you know, the, the, the same for our routers. Our routers are right here. Some of them have self-signed certs, but generally it's like, you know, just, you know, it's just, you know, 192.168.1.1 or something. And it, you could say, you could argue it doesn't, there's no point in it being HTTPS. But again, our browser's like, oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you, know you might be up to, to no good here. It's like, oh, okay, fine. So anyway, the point is, I'm sure that, that Google is saying at this point, it's past time that any resources on the net should need to be HTTP. So we're just going to put our foot down because the only way this is going to get fixed if we say no. And then if those end up being important, they'll be moved over to HTTPS. So we're, you know, we're sort of at that point right now where it's like, this is it. Um, uh, in a couple other or one other one or two. Oh, yeah. Two other features. Uh, they uh, Chrome 85 also allows you to create shortcuts for progressive web apps so that uh, users will be able to quickly access commonly used tasks for which they use progressive web apps. You can hold your mouse over the PWA icon or right click it and you'll get a list of of those that are uh, enabled. And also back on the uh, security and privacy side, We've talked often through the years about abuse of the huge of the user agent header. Uh, whenever our browser is making a query, one of the metadata tags in that query identifies a lot of features about the browser. Uh, and you know, like so many features that were designed as an in the beginning as an aid to the web's operation like cookies, for example, of, uh, as an example of another one, the user agent string has been abused for tracking web browser users. You know, it's an information-laden, relatively static thing that unfortunately has a lot of unique information. Uh, the cool idea, and the reason it was originally created, was that the browser itself and its various add-ons could add their own designations and their version numbers to that string so that web servers receiving a query might become version number aware and thereby able to may perhaps work around known problems or lacks of features with specific versions or probably with back in the early days with specific browsers. It was like, oh, well, you know, this browser doesn't support this. So they would serve up a slightly different page depending upon the profile of who was doing the asking. Um, anyway, as I said, this, th this is, you know, as a consequence of this, there's like some weird attributes that user agent strings have acquired over the years. Um, like, to claiming that they are who they're not in order for them to, to receive content that they actually do know how to render. Um, so to combat this problem, Google had originally planned to enable uh, the addition of a new feature called user agent client hints into last Tuesday's Chrome 85. But in another concession to the coronavirus, Google decided to drop this back into 2021, I think April, if I recall right, but I, but you anyway, know, next year, uh, when it does happen, it will by default simplify the user agent string so that it becomes much less juicy as another tracking signal. It is in Chrome 84. That is previous to 85. It's just not enabled yet. But it can be switched on if you were to go to Chrome colon slash slash flags forward slash and then pound freeze hyphen user hyphen agent. Uh, 
that flag you can turn on, which will essentially remove a lot of the extraneous information used for tracking today. So you could try it and, and see how it goes. Again, it's, it's expected to be the default. And so at some point, I'm sure Google will start experimenting to make sure that it doesn't break things that are uh, mission critical. Uh, in a, in almost a, uh, like, well, state sponsored spy story, we have something that really happened. Uh, and I can tease this by quoting our friend Marcus Hutchins Twitter reaction upon learning of it. Uh, just to remind everyone, Marcus is the well-known security researcher and reformed cybercrime hacker. You know, he actually reformed in his teenage years, but the FBI didn't forgive him for that. Uh, and of course, as we know, his future became uncertain when the FBI grabbed him uh, in Las Vegas's Logan Airport as he was departing or preparing to depart for uh, from the U.S., for his home in the UK following the annual Black Hat and DEF CON conferences. Well, last Thursday, reacting on Twitter to the news of this story, which had just broken, Marcus quite correctly observed, he tweeted, quote, one of the benefits of cybercrime is criminals don't have to expose themselves to unnecessary risk by conducting business in person. Flying into the U.S. jurisdiction to have malware manually installed on a company's network is absolutely insane, unquote. Okay, so what was all that about? A 27-year-old Russian national by the name of Igor Igorovich Kruchnikov traveled to the U.S. and attempted to subvert and bribe an employee working at Tesla Corporation's massive Nevada-based Gigafactory. Igor ultimately agreed to pay the employee $1 million to plant malware inside Tesla's internal network. Um, the good news is the employee reported the offer <laughs> to his employer, Tesla, and then worked with the FBI to build an airtight case and to set up a sting, which included having him covertly record face-to-face -face meetings discussing this Russian, this 27-year-old Russian's proposal. In their complaint, which followed Igor's arrest and arraignment, uh, last Tuesday, the prosecutors wrote, the purpose of the conspiracy was to recruit an employee of a company to surreptitiously transmit malware provided by the co-conspirators into the company's computer system, exfiltrate data from the company's network, and threaten to disclose the data online unless the company paid the co-conspirators ransom demand. The complaint said that the malware would be custom developed to propagate through the company's network. For it to work, the group said it needed the employee to provide information about the employer's network authorizations and network procedures. Uh, Karuchikov Karuch said the malware would be transmitted either by inserting a USB drive into a company computer or clicking on an email attachment containing malware. Igor explained that the infecting computer would have to run continuously for six to eight hours for the malware to move fully through the network. To distract network personnel, a first stage of the malware would perform a denial-of-service attack while a second stage performed the data exfiltration. When the complaint was initially unsealed last Tuesday, the identities of all parties was still confidential, being identified only as Company A and CHS1, which is their abbreviation for 
confidential human source number one, that is the employee. But last Thursday, Elon Musk confirmed that, yes, indeed, it was his company that was the target of this whole operation. The charging document, which was filed in, in federal court in Nevada, detailed an extensive and determined attempt to infect Tesla's network. The defendant, again, 27-year-old Igor, uh, Igorovich uh, Krutchkov, allegedly traveled from Russia to Nevada and then met with the unnamed employee on multiple occasions. When uh, Igor's initial $500,000 bid failed to clinch the deal, the defendant doubled the offer to $1 million. According to the complaint, Krechikov whined and dined and boozed up the employee, and when discussing especially sensitive details, conducted conversations in cars. When FBI agents couldn't conduct physical surveillance in restaurants or bars, the employee recorded them. One meeting occurred on August 7th in a car Krechkov had rented, referring to the employee again as CHS1. The prosecutors described that August 7th meeting as follows. They said, during this meeting, which the FBI had consensually recorded, Krechkov reiterated some of the details of the criminal activity previously proposed to CHS-1. Krechkov described the malware attack as he did before, adding that the first part of the attack, a DDoS, would be successful for the group, in quotes, but the victim company's security officers would think the attack had failed. Krechkov, and here's some news, again listed prior companies this group had targeted. Krechkov stated each of these targeted companies had a person working at those companies who installed malware on behalf of the group. To ease CHS-1's concerns about getting caught, Krechkov claimed the oldest project the group had worked on took place three and a half years ago and the group's co-optee still worked for the company. So, in other words, this group has been active for three and a half years, has previously, if we're believing Krechkov, his assertions to this employee at Tesla, they have multiple times successfully bribed, presumably, and co-opted someone, an insider, getting them to to work with them, to, to, to conspire, to insert malware into various U.S. companies to pull this off. Uh, and so, of course, we can imagine that now that Krechkov has been nabbed by the FBI, of great interest will be which are these companies and maybe who are the co-optees as well. Anyway, Krechkov also told the Tesla employee the group had technical staff who would ensure the malware could not be tracked back to the employee. In fact, Krechkov claimed the group could attribute the attacker to another person at the victim company. Should there be someone in mind the employee wanted to teach a lesson, unquote. During the meeting, uh, CS, CHS1, the, the Tesla employee, expect, expressed how concerned and stressed he had been over the request. He stated if he were to agree to install the malware, he would need more money. Krechkov asked how much, and the employee responded, a million dollars. Krechkov was sympathetic to the request and said he understood. Remember, this is a recording that that uh, the FBI has and is part of this complaint uh, that he understood and would have to contact the group before agreeing to the request. Igor confided that the group was paying him half a million dollars 
for his participation in getting this employee to install the malware, and he was willing to give a significant portion of the payment, 300000 to 450000 to the employee to entice his involvement. The employee said he would need um, money up front to ensure that Igor would not have him install the software and then not pay him. Again, Igor asked how much, and the Tesla employee responded, $50,000. Igor said this was an acceptable amount and a reasonable request, but he would have to work on this because he only had $10,000 with him due to U.S. customs restrictions on the amount of money he could bring into the country. Igor also questioned what, what would prevent Tesla employee from taking the upfront money and then not following through on installing malware. The employee stated that he was sure Igor or the group would figure a way to apply leverage against the employee to ensure that he held up his end of the arrangement. Uh, they, dis they discussed the timing of the next meeting and Igor said he would return to Reno on or around August 17th of 2020. So, yikes. Uh, this would have been a classic inside job. Uh, and it does serve as a reminder that just as money motivate, motivates the bad guys, uh, it's also, as we know, a time-honored motivator uh, used to turn someone, uh, anyone. And as I said, it's... Uh, also a little bit sobering that if, again, if we believe what Igor was saying, uh, this doesn't look like the first time this group has done this. Uh, and maybe the FBI will be able to get some information uh, about other companies this has happened to. And, that, and you can imagine if the FBI approached those companies, uh, suddenly the company is wondering, OK, uh, who was the co-conspirator in this? So, uh very, very interesting problem. Uh, Leo, let's take our second break. Okay. I mean, it's just industrial espionage. I'm sure it happens all the time, really. I don't. Yeah. It's not sadly. political. It's industrial. There's technologies right. that one company or country wants, and uh, we have right now. That's why you might want to use ExpressVPN. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Our sponsor for this segment is ExpressVPN. The protect your privacy, protect your security when you're online. You need ExpressVPN. It lets you access the internet uh, the way you want to. It lets you keep your internet service provider or carrier from seeing what you're doing and then sharing that with marketers, selling it to the highest bidder. You don't want that. You don't want people to snoop on your Wi-Fi and try to snarf passwords or locations. You don't want that. And nowadays, we're spending a lot of time watching uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime. Maybe you'd also like to expand your horizons. Yes, you can do that with ExpressVPN. It lets you essentially travel to a different country without ever leaving home. I use ExpressVPN on everything. It's on all the time on all my devices. That's partly for security, partly for privacy. But one of the things I love is I can choose from nearly 100 different countries. ExpressVPN has pops, points of presence in almost 100 different countries, including, let's say, the UK. I have to catch up on Doctor Who. I think I'm going to be Doctor Who for Halloween. There's a lot of episodes I've missed. It's not on Netflix US. It is on Netflix UK. So all I do is fire up ExpressVPN. Instead of using their smart technology to choose the fastest, closest server, I'm going to explicitly choose London. And now, as far as uh, anybody knows, I'm emerging from the Internet in London. I am in London. I refresh Netflix, and suddenly I see all the Doctor Who episodes on Netflix UK. That's awesome. With ExpressVPN, you're protecting yourself, your privacy, but you can also unlock thousands of new shows and movies from streaming libraries across the globe. And and one of the reasons you can do this with ExpressVPN is because it's the fastest VPN out there. Watch an HD video on ExpressVPN, no problem. That's why I leave it running all the time. I don't even know I'm running it, you know, unless I check, unless I look and see the VPN in the corner or whatever, because um, it's so fast. And ExpressVPNs on everything I use, phones, Android, iOS, laptops, Linux, Windows, Mac, tablets, the iPad, even on your smart TV. 
And it works with most streaming services, Netflix, yes, Amazon Prime, BBC iPlayer, YouTube, and many more. You can choose from hundreds of different countries. It's very easy. Just fire up ExpressVPN, choose the country of your choice, hit connect, refresh the page, the show or movie you want to watch will magically appear. Not just, by the way, Doctor Who and Black Adder. I love Black Adder. Star Trek Discovery. You can watch that in Netflix UK with your existing Netflix account. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Netflix Canada. But you ain't seen nothing until you've seen Rick and Morty in France. <laughs> or the French Prince of Bel-Air in Australia, mate. Uh, you're going to love ExpressVPN. And right now we got a great deal for you. Less than 7 bucks a month when you take advantage of the special offer at expressvpn.com slash security. Now you'll get three extra months free with your one-year package. That gives you the best price, and it's such a good deal. It, it just hits all the points. No logging, absolutely private, absolutely secure, and you can be anywhere in the world with a push of a button. expressvpn.com slash security. Now get three months free with your one-year package. expressvpn.com. Slash security now. It also prevents industrial espionage. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> On with the show. So uh, we've got more problems with the EMV standard. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this over the years. EMV is the monetary transaction method based upon more than, uh, and this is part of the problem, a 2,000-page specification. Of course. <laughs> so if your security spec is 2,000 pages, uh, you know, Who can uh, that's read that? Who can follow that? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And who can verify right. that, like, the way it works is proper. Um, it's the technical standard underlying the use of smart payment cards, payment terminals, and ATMs. EMV originally stood for Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, the three companies who created the standard. And, of course, that's part of the problem. Is Rather than making it an open, academic, cryptographer-laced process, it's more like the Wi-Fi Alliance that, you know, did it privately, and now they're sorry. Um so next May of 2011, researchers from ETH Zurich, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, whose work we've often covered in the past, they'll be delivering a paper at the IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy titled The EMV Standard Break, Fix, and Verify. The paper's been released in advance, presumably because this is really bad and it cannot be readily, well, it, it, it can be readily patched and fixed, but keeping it a secret doesn't make any sense. So they're like saying, look, let's get this fixed. We're going to talk all about it because the, the coolness of their paper is the way they found the problems. It's important that the problems exist, as we'll see, but the the the, me, the mechanism of what they used is not going to lose any of its punch for waiting nearly a year. Um, uh, so it's not a matter of responsible disclosure. Uh, uh, it's also not the end of the world since the attacks so far designed still require physical proximity to a Visa card, but the attack described does completely bypass the system's built-in security measures of the PIN, which is designed to prevent abuse of, you know, a stolen Visa card. It also bypasses completely any payment transaction limits, which are designed to limit the damage in the case of abuse. So, you know, hopefully this has got the attention of the, the relevant parties. The, the paper's abstract which describes their research, reads, EMV is the international protocol standard for smart card payment used in over 9 billion cards worldwide. Despite the standard's advertised security, various issues have been previously uncovered 
deriving from logical flaws that are hard to spot in EMV's lengthy and complex specification running over 2,000 pages. We formalize, they wrote, a comprehensive symbolic model of EMV in Tamarin, a state-of-the-art protocol verifier. Our model is the first that supports a fine-grained analysis of all relevant security guarantees that EMV is intended to offer. We use our model to automatically identify flaws that lead to two critical attacks, one that defrauds the cardholder and another that defrauds the merchant. First, criminals can use a victim's visa contactless card for high value purchases without knowledge of the card's PIN. We built a proof of concept Android app and successfully demonstrated this attack on real world payment terminals. In other words, once this, this model found flaws, they then said, oh, uh, we know how to do that. And so they wrote some Android apps that actually takes two apps and two phones. I'll explain all that in a minute, which pulled off the heist. It works. Second, they said, criminals can trick the terminal into accepting an unauthentic offline transaction, which the issuing bank should later decline after the criminal has walked away with the goods. This attack is possible for implementations following the standard, although we did not test it on actual terminals for ethical reasons. In other words, it would have defrauded the merchant, they said, though it seems like you know, they could, that could have been handled by engaging a willing and interested merchant and like, you know, giving back the goods uh, after the bank declined the, the transaction. In, in any event, they said, finally, we propose and verify improvements to the standard that prevent these attacks, as well as any other attacks that violate the considered security properties. The proposed improvements can be easily implemented in the terminals and do not affect the cards in circulation. So that's important. We cannot update 9 billion existing Visa cards, nor do we have to. The terminals can be fixed, and hopefully, you know, they're connected to a network, and they can be updated online, you know, over the network. So it looks like, you know, this can be remediated globally without much trouble. Um, anyway, so this, this EMV standard... Uh, as I noted, was developed by another closed group. And this is what you get when that happens. Uh, to establish a bit of background, the researchers wrote, EMV, named after its founders, Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, is the worldwide standard for smart card payment developed in the mid-1990s. And, you know, truthfully, given that it's, what, 25 years old? I, I, I guess I cut it a little bit of slack. They certainly didn't know how to do things then as well as we do today. And what is so cool is that we're beginning to see the emergence. We've covered some already recently of applying eh, not quite AI, but automated protocol verification to, to bring real guarantees of robustness to protocols. Anyway, they, they, they said as of December 2019, more than 80% of all card present transactions globally use EMV, reaching up to 98% in many European countries. In other words, you know, 80% as of Decem uh, December 2019. So basically that's what transactions are using is this EMV protocol. Banks have a strong incentive to adopt EMV due to the liability shift, which relieves banks using the standard from any liability from payment disputes. If the disputed transaction was authorized by a PIN, then the consumer is held liable. If a paper signature was used instead, 
then the merchant is charged. But in neither case is the bank responsible. So besides the liability shift, EMV's global acceptance is also attributed to its advertised security. However, EMV's security has been challenged numerous times. Man-in-the-middle attacks, card cloning, downgrade attacks, relay attacks, and card skimming are all examples of successful exploits of the standard shortcomings. So in other words, yes, it's 25 years old and it is showing its age because it was never rigorously developed and it was, re it was developed in a closed setting. Uh, they said the MITM, the man in the middle attack, is believed to have been used by criminals in 2010 and 2011 in France and Belgium to carry out fraudulent transactions totaling 600,000 euros. The underlying flaw of the attack is that the card's response to the terminal's offline PIN verification request is not authenticated. Some of the security issues identified result from flawed implementations of the standard. Others stem from logical flaws whose repairs would require changes to the entire EMV infrastructure. In other words, meaning it's too late to fix them now. They said identifying such flaws is far from trivial due to the complexity of EMV's execution flow, which is highly flexible in terms of card authentication modes. In other words, this suffers from the kitchen sink problem of security. Uh, also, they said cardholder verification methods and online offline authorizations. Again, they just tried to do everything with this. This raises the question of how we can systematically explore all possible flows and improve the standard to avoid another 20 years of attacks. So that's what they did. They explain, in this paper, we focus on weakness and improvements to the EMV protocol design. We present a formal, comprehensive model for the symbolic analysis of EMV's security. Our model is written in Tamarin, a state-of-the-art verification tool that has been used to study numerous real-world protocols, including TLS 1.3 and 5G authentication. Tamarin supports protocol verification in the presence of powerful adversaries and many concurrent protocol sessions without bounds. Our model supports the analysis of all properties that must hold in any EMV transaction. An informal description of the three most relevant properties are bank accepts terminal accepted transactions, no transaction accepted by the terminal can be declined by the bank, authentication to the terminal, all transactions accepted by the terminal are authenticated by the card and, if authorized online, by the bank, and third, authentication to the bank. All transactions accepted by the bank are authenticated by the card and the terminal. They said, our model faithfully considers the three roles present in an EMV session, the bank, the terminal, and the card. Previous symbolic models merge the terminal and the bank into a single agent. This merging incorrectly entails that the terminal can verify all card produced cryptographic proofs that the bank can. This is incorrect as the card and bank share a symmetric key that is only known to them. Using our model, they said, we identify a critical violation of authentication properties by the Visa contactless protocol. Specifically, the cardholder verification method used in a transaction, if any, is neither authenticated nor cryptographically protected against modification. We developed a proof of concept Android app that exploits this to bypass pin verification by mounting a man in the middle attack that instructs the terminal that pin verification is not required because the cardholder verification was performed on the consumer's device. This enables criminals 
to use any stolen Visa card to pay for expensive goods without the card's PIN. In other words, the PIN is useless in Visa contactless transactions. So in practice, they used a pair of standard Android smartphones, each running a, a custom app that they wrote. The smartphones do not need to be hacked. No root privileges or anything fancy is required. Just generic custom Android apps, which successfully ran on phones. In this case, they used them both on Pixel phones from Google and also handsets from Huawei. The two phones are linked by Wi-Fi so they can talk to each other. One phone uses its NFC radio to interact with the stolen card, thus pretending to be and emulating the point-of-sale terminal, which the card thinks it's talking to, while the other phone uses its NFC radio to emulate the payment card to the authentic point-of-sale terminal, thus the point of sale terminal thinks it's talking to the card. It's instead talking to the Android phones, uh, NFC. So you can see what this does is each of the devices that the, the card and the terminal normally have an NFC link to each other. Instead, we separate them with an Android phone based link, the, allowing the protocol to be modified on the fly. And the point is this system is unfortunately weak enough that the protocol can be tweaked as it moves between the two Android phones to, to convince the card that it's talking to the point of sale terminal and to convince the point of sale terminal that the pin has been, been managed between the user and the card. Therefore, it, it, the, the terminal need not ask for a pin. And there's another protocol flaw that allows the, the, a limit which is normally imposed on pin-based transactions exactly for this purpose to simply be bypassed. So a, an unlimited size transaction can be performed against an NFC-linked uh, uh, EMV terminal used in 98% of transactions in, in the EU and 80 globally against any Visa contactless payment card without needing the PIN from the owner. As I said, this is a, a, an important piece of work. They, they took a 2,000 page spec, which you know is mind boggling complex, reduced it to a symbology which then allowed them to code this into an app that was able in, in, into uh, their their research app that was able to analyze the resulting protocol, spot the flaws, and from that they developed a proof of concept which successfully works, and hopefully uh, it'll be possible to uh, you know they indicated it was a a fix was possible in the point of sale terminal which. Uh, with any luck, we'll be going out to all of these point of sale terminals globally uh, before much longer. So anyway, very, very cool piece of work from uh, these uh, uh, researchers in Switzerland and uh, and really sort of a, a demonstration of uh, the, the way we're seeing high level analysis of security protocols now being performed. It's not just ad hoc analysis, uh, for, especially for things that are as complex as this. Uh, you, you develop a means for turning a computer loose on it and allowing it to highlight problems and, and find them for you. you know, and then you go manually look to see what's going on. You know, on the flip side, uh, we've seen something sort of like that with directed fuzzing, where we use a computer to, to throw you know, just junk at an API, and if it manages to crash the system, then you you bring the humans in to figure out what it was that did the crash, reproduce it, and then see if it's possible to instrument it. So, very cool. Um, I have some miscellany 
uh, some closing the loop stuff, but some miscellany. Um, back in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, I shared a few YouTube videos that seemed important. Uh, thanks to the use of my grc.sc redirect links, uh, I'm able to get some sense for our listeners' interest in various topics. Uh, 5,963 of our listeners visited the first of those COVID links I shared. Um, that was that excellent Ars Technica guide in the very early days that provided some, some information very useful. 6,376 visited the second, which was uh, the Coronavirus Explained video. And 5,942 visited the third, which was that whiteboard, that medical school class grade whiteboard on COVID-19. Um, and those numbers place COVID-19 or, or interest in it at the top of the historical counts of the links visited. So today I have a fourth, uh, which is, frankly, an astonishing video uh, produced by a hardworking medical doctor researcher explaining the operation of the three primary technologies employed for testing for the presence of the COVID-19 virus or antibodies. Uh, the link is grc.sc slash COVID4, C-O-V-I-D-4. Again, grc.sc slash C-O-V-I-D-4. Um, I believe that aside from being seriously educated about the operation of these tests, uh, frankly, in way too much detail. So, you know, don't worry about understanding it all the first time you watch it. Just sort of let it wash over you. I, I was really impressed. Anyone watching this will come away with a deep appreciation for the complexity of testing, a sober sense for how much medical science has successfully reverse engineered our genetics. I, I, it's just really cool. Uh, and perhaps some better sense for why it appears that so far testing for COVID-19 has been seriously botched. Uh, it is a truly delicate, error prone and error fraught process. You'll get many clues about that from watching this video. It's about a 43 minute long video. Uh, and, and testing just could not succeed in any environment of corner cutting or rushing uh, to get a result. Uh, but anyway, don't take my word for it. If you watch the video, uh, you'll understand. So grc.sc slash COVID4. Uh, it's probably too much for some people who aren't interested in details, but it's really, really compelling. Uh, and again, I, our, our, it's clear that our, our listeners had an, an interest in it. And so I, I wanted to extend this. I ju this just came to my attention. Somebody posted it over in the grc.health news group. And so uh, it's just, it's excellent. I received a DM from a listener saying, hi, Steve. I was wondering if storing password manager database in Google Drive or Dropbox is safe. Uh, and so I suggested that the best thing to do would be to first use the 7-zip archiver with a strong password. We talked about it recently. It will, first of all, it'll scrunch the, the password database way down. And once it's encrypted with a strong password, it won't matter who obtains it. You know, this is the old TNO approach of of trust no one where you you encrypt before it leaves your system. Um, uh, and, you know, we talked about 7-Zip recently. I looked deep into it again. They did all of the encryption right. They use a strong password-based key derivation function based on SHA-256 to generate the encryption key. Uh, and uh, at that point, once you've done that, it's probably the password manager that's keeping all of those private is is the weakest link because they're you know they're in active use. If you if you create a an arc a really well encrypted archive with a strong password, your stuff is safe. And then by all means you can you know put it anywhere pretty much. Um, 
Alan Kopp tweeted, a little puzzled by your recommendation or by your recommending sync thing last week. Are you really okay with it doing its connecting over the internet without a VPN? And Leo, this, this links back to what you and I were talking about uh, before the podcast. And I replied to him. I said, yes, I'm okay with sync thing because of the way it's designed. All endpoints can and typically do sit safely behind a NAT router. So there's no port open to be scanned. A set of rendezvous servers out on the public internet receive outbound pings from the sync thing endpoints. And all communication is over TLS version 1.2 with the rendezvous server certificates pinned by the clients. So the privacy of the conversations is as strong as any VPNs. If a bad guy were to compromise one of the rendezvous servers, they could send their ID, their endpoint ID, to an endpoint and ask to be connected. But that's the extent of the threat. Uh, as anyone using the sync thing knows, you get a you get a notice saying, you know, this endpoint wants to connect to you and share stuff, and you have to permit it in order for anything to happen. So you would just see this bogus request and say, uh, no. I mean, that's it. Like in the worst case, that's all that would happen. And SyncThing clients are able to use public STUN servers, S-T-U-N servers, to knit together direct NAT-to-NAT -NAT connections between peers that are both located behind NAT routers. We discussed the STUN and TURN protocols to support NAT many years ago. Uh, and if direct NAT transversal fails, Relay servers are also available for inter-client relaying. But even then, since all data is truly end-to-end -end encrypted between client endpoints with certificates, there's no exposure of the relayed data to the relay server. So, yes, I don't know, as we said, I mean, I'm, I'm using it to transport, like, Mission critical stuff, Leo. I know you are, and you know I do so without question. These guys. Uh, oh, and uh, all of the protocol is open. They have beautifully documented uh, four different specific protocols. Uh, like like the the block transfer protocol is laid out. It's it's explained. It's like you know it's RFC like uh, in in its thoroughness. So. I'm just very impressed with, with sync thing, and I, I, I use it without concern. Oh, I'm so happy because I uh, use it religiously for yeah. everything, everything. Yeah, it is, it's just a win. And I think and, I'm going to do that, uh, kind of this ties your previous question together, do some pre-internet encryption on a sync thing folder because there's files I want to get on all my uh, computers, but I'm just nervous about having them visible in any way. If I... Use 7-zip, for instance, to password encrypt them and then sync that blob, that would be even yep. even safer, wouldn't it? Things like my yep. dot .files, my, you know, PGP passwords, things like that. Not passwords, yeah, but Yeah, uh, I would say, if, you know, if, if they're really critical and they don't need to have, like, automated access, if, 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 if for example, you, you, you want to have access to them, but you'd be unpacking them and then sticking them in the root directory of a new Linux build or something, then... Then it would make sense. Yeah, exactly. If, if it doesn't that's have to what be I dynamically do. modified. Yeah, that's exactly what yeah. I do. Yeah, I, it's a I keep a I keep a standardized dot files. And anytime I do a new setup, I want to have that there. So that's yeah. perfect. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I'm so, glad you mentioned sync thing. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I needed yeah. your serious it's good. Seal and of approval. just the ability to build an ad hoc peer to peer yeah. network. I mean, it's just it's yeah, very cool with no third party. So. John tweeted, someone named John tweeted via DM. He says, do you have a recommendation on a zinc supplement? He said, my doctor suggested I add a zinc supplement to my vitamin regimen. He says, thanks for all the health insights you've shared on Security Now over the years. And so I do have something useful, probably to a lot of our listeners. Um, there's only one, or at least one very clear way to choose which one from among many? Uh, and I'll, I'll just give a little brief bit of what I've learned about this since I crossed this bridge 15 years ago. 
The most important thing to appreciate is that not everything we swallow is absorbed the way we intend across our intestinal lining to make it into our bloodstream. And things that do not naturally occur in food, like a mineral supplement, are often not readily absorbed because we're trying to fool Mother Nature. Uh, as it turns out, in this instance, she can be fooled. Um, I looked at this 15 years ago after I read several books about magnesium. I became convinced, as I remain today, that I wanted to get as much magnesium into me as I could for the rest of my life. It's for other for reasons maybe I'll discuss someday. It's really crucial. Um, and that's what I've been doing ever since. But it turns out that's easier said than done. Um, you know, since this is not a health and nutrition podcast, I won't spend the hours talking about what I easily could because it fascinates me. Maybe someday. So here's the bottom line. Most mineral sub supplements are packaged as a simple salt of the mineral. Zinc citrate, zinc picolinate, zinc gluconate, for example, in the case of zinc. The problem with all of these simple salts of zinc, or, or magnesium for that matter, is that those compounds quickly disassociate in the acidic low pH environment of our stomach. After that, we have atoms of the mineral floating around loose and not being well absorbed by the lining of our upper small intestine. One company named Albion Minerals, A-L-B-I-O-N, Albion Minerals, figured out how to solve this problem. They produce a large range of raw material, both for animal, veterinary, and human consumption. They turn the raw mineral into a dipeptide, which is the mineral bound to two amino acids. Glycine, which is the smallest of the amino acids, is the preferred choice. So there exists a substance known as zinc bisglycinate, consisting of an atom of zinc held in by two glycine molecules. What's special about this complex is that our digestive system sees it as an organic molecule rather than a mineral. And unlike any of the salts, it's resistant to disassociation in the, uh, oh, and it remains intact as a consequence in our stomach's acidic low pH environment. That allows it to progress as a whole into our intestines where our intestinal lumen's active transport disassembles it and moves it into our bloodstream. The result is that a far greater percentage of what we swallow makes it into us. Uh, Albion is not a retailer, they, so you'll see no brands, you won't see any supplements by them. They exclusively manufacture the bulk supplement raw material. Um, so you'll find their name and their trademarks, Albion and Trax, T-R-A-A-C-S, which is some, some abbreviation for, for something, uh, some means of measuring it. On the supplements, you know, Doctors Best uses them, Healthy Origin uses them, and a number of other supplement makers do. So for what it's worth, when shopping for mineral supplements, look for the words Albion or Trax, T-R-A-A-C-S. Uh, I, I just, I jumped onto Amazon, Googled Z Albion Zinc, and found an inexpensive zinc supplement, which I linked, to, I responded to John uh, and it was, you know, zinc bisglycinate uh, available from a supplier. And what does the zinc do, on, just on, out of on, curiosity? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll well, take it as uh, given I want a, it. but <laughs> Yes, a zinc is a useful supplement. It uh, provides immune system support. Oh, that's for one probably thing. a good thing to have, yeah. Yeah, Nowadays. so it's a good thing to have these days. I take the magnesium but, uh, you recommended that's also Trax. So, yes. as you mentioned. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I... I I consume it in great quantities, and uh, you eat a lot more than I do. I, I do, I do two tablets uh, in the morning and at night. I, what do you do? Like five twice a day, something like that. I do. Yes, yeah. I do five <laughs> twice a day. But I'm glad you're taking two, Leo. It, it's better it's than good. nothing. It yeah, can affect it is. your uh, um, in, uh, digestive system a little bit, so you want to kind of work your way up. <laughs> to, well, that exactly. That's how you determine where your limit is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you'll know when you'll know you'll when know. you've taken too much. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Let's just what, put it this way. My, it's the same uh, ingredient in milk of magnesia. Just <laughs> give you some idea. Okay. <laughs> one, one, one of my um, be, my high school buddies, uh, uh, two of them became MDs. One is a lifelong ER doc. Uh, and in fact, he lives up in Healdsburg, where he's only recently been allowed to return to his wonderful uh, ranch on uh on a vineyard oh, as a result yeah. of the fires We've up there been recently. So bad, yeah. Anyway, but but he just he's a lifelong ER doc and he calls magnesium the miracle mineral. Really? So wow. uh, apparently it's been of great use for him uh, in helping people who are, you know, in I, emergent trouble. I take it on faith. Uh, you told me to take it, I take it. I, I'm glad you do. <laughs> yes. So anyway, lastly, uh, I got a a, a a tweet from LOL Panda, who said, uh, hi, Steve, I'm sorry to tweet here. I don't know why he's apologizing, but that's what Twitter's for. But he says, I'm so excited to say hello and thank you, exclamation point, exclamation point. Once again, Spinrite helped me by saving hours of work. Spinrite isn't only a matter of zero and one. It's magic trillion thanks nice and that by way of uh, update i can finally report that the development of the ahci driver has reached a new and very welcome stage test release 29a of the ahci benchmark was posted to the group last week and it has been rather exhaustively tested over the weekend for the first time ever there has not been a single problem that anyone has found running it on any of their various PCs. So it appears to be ready for its much larger and broader testing debut. Once this podcast is conducted or c concluded, conducted and concluded today, uh, I'll be integrating the earlier IDE hardware driver work into the new AHCI driver to produce a single benchmark that should run at maximum possible speed on any drive and be able to benchmark any drive's read performance on any PC and on older Macs that offer the boot camp uh, booting option. We got a bunch of Mac users who have been testing this along the way. And in fact, I bought a Mac, an older MacBook uh, Pro, because there was a weird power management behavior that I was unable to untangle remotely. And, and I did after I got one. Uh, so just for the record, so I don't, so people don't go off looking for it. I don't have anything yet. Uh, there's no download link. Uh, I need to integrate things. I'll end up building an app, which like the init disc will prepare a bootable USB thumb drive that they, you can use to boot any computer you want to uh, and benchmarks it, its hard drives at absolutely their maximum uh, link and throughput speed probably surprise you with some of the things that you find based on some of the things that we have found. Uh, and in the process, you'll be further testing this driver uh, and I'll have a web forum set up to, uh, in order to solicit feedback. Uh, from users, and that's like the final stage before this moves into Spinrite, and we get 6.1. So we're getting there. Nice. And Leo, speaking of getting there, let's we're take here. our last break, and then <laughs> we're here. And then <laughs> we'll talk about what you did last summer. Oh, my gosh. We didn't have enough room in the lower third for the entire title. I know what you did last summer, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, but I think you can imagine it. Uh, our show today brought to you, we're talking about password managers, brought to you by LastPass. One of the beauties of LastPass, as far as I'm concerned, is I don't need to do any, you know, fooling around with the 7-Zip and, and Dropbox and all that stuff because LastPass securely stores uh, my passwords, all my stuff, not just passwords. I consider it a secure enclave for anything I want to keep private, including my driver's license, my passport, social security numbers, uh GPG keys, things like that. It's all stored there. It's all encrypted. It's never decrypted anywhere but on device. Only you have the last master password to your LastPass vault. It's never transmitted to LastPass. But because they do transmit the encrypted blog to their servers, it means when I install a new, set up a new phone, which I'm going to be doing a bit this uh, fall, uh, it's easy. I, first thing I install is LastPass, and boom, everything's on there. 
And that's the beauty of it. They, of course, follow the best practices in a whole bunch of ways to keep your data safe, uh, including PBKTF2 to, to prevent brute force, cracking of the password vault. LastPass knows if you are a business that you're facing particularly hard times right now with your work from home workforce, your employees who at least used to be under your umbrella when they were at the office. Now, who knows what networks are using, what password practices, where those post-it notes are landing. Maybe they're texting each other passwords. You need LastPass. LastPass surveyed 700 IT and security professionals across a whole range of industries from financial services to IT to retail. More than half, more than half, 82% said their business has been exposed to risk because of poor identity and access management. IAM, those are the magic initials everybody's talking about right now. The good news is there's a very simple solution. Thank goodness we adopted that solution. I adopted LastPass personally more than a decade ago. Steve's LastPass review was literally 10 years ago. Uh, he talked to Joe Segrist and found out how everything worked. Um, and uh, we started using LastPass in business uh, in the old studio more than, I think, five or six years ago. And thank goodness, because now with our employees working from home, I don't have to worry about IAM. I know that they're secure. You want your employees to have secure password storage. Of course, that's, you know, the core of the LastPass functionality. It's not all it does, but it's the it's where it starts. LastPass gives each employee his or her own vault for storing every app and web login they use. The most important thing LastPass does, and I think it's kind of remarkable, we usually we talk about, and we talk about this show all the time, the, the trade-off between convenience and security. More convenient, less secure. More secure, less convenient. Not with LastPass. LastPass actually makes it easy and safe for employees to, for instance, share logins while keeping your corporate data safe. It's all done through the LastPass app in a highly secure fashion, so they're not texting or emailing passwords to employees. They offer, among other things, a single sign-on solution. With over 1,300 apps, almost certainly the ones you use. And that means employees love it because they don't have to even do passwords. You just say, yeah, that's me on their phone. But you get a centralized view. IT always has insight into who has access to what from where. That's so important. Uh, shadow IT, enforceable policies across all password-protected accounts. We, for instance, require our employees use two-factor on their last pass master password. Uh, you can do that. We have a minimum requirements for their master password, no monkey one, two, three. Enterprise password management needs to have a little bit of, it's a different beast a little bit. Things like those shadow IT and the, and the, and the uh, access policies are very important. LastPass also does multi-factor authentication, which uh, I, we were talking about this on um, Mac Break Weekly. The idea that, yeah, you can have fingerprint, or face ID, or, you know, but wouldn't it be better if you had fingerprint and face ID? And maybe more, maybe gate analysis, maybe IP address, maybe geolocation, all of which combine to ensure both it's easier for employees, right? Because the authentication is kind of always going on in the background. And it's it's more secure. And you know exactly who's using what, when, where. That's That's what you need. Employees always have their passwords with them iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux, every browser. You can get access to whatever they need, wherever they're working from any device. Working remotely is more convenient, not more frustrating. And, of course, they use AES-256, PBKDF2, salted hashes. They, you know, they do it all right. Your data is encrypted and decrypted only at device level. LastPass. It's the number one password manager for a good reason, but don't just think of it as a personal password manager. You need it for enterprise too. LastPass will securely manage your users' identities, letting your employees work efficiently, more conveniently, without making your business vulnerable from cyber threats. That's, ex that's the golden, the holy grail, the golden award. LastPass.com slash twit. LastPass dot com slash twit we use it i use it religiously so should you lastpass.com slash twit steve what did i do last summer because i don't remember <laughs> it's, it's all a blur i don't think any of us i think a lot of us did very little this last <laughs> yeah, summer that's right um there are two pieces of research 
one conducted eight years ago in 2012, and a similar, very closely related research, which was presented just last month during the USENIC's 16th Symposium on Usable Privacy and Security. The earlier paper from 2012 was titled, uh, interestingly, Why Johnny Can't Browse in Peace. <laughs> Okay. Okay. On the on the uniqueness of web browsing history patterns, uh, it explains its purpose and its findings as follows. They wrote, "We present the results of the first large scale study of the uniqueness of web browsing histories, gathered from a total of a lot, three hundred and." 68,284 internet users who visited a history detection demonstration website. Um, and remember, we've previously talked about how this can be done. Um, since our browsers will color previously visited URL links differently from ones that it has not seen before, it's possible for a sneaky website and server to remotely probe our browser's site visiting history by placing test URLs into the DOM, the document, ob the document object module, uh, model, sorry, document object model, and then using the Canvas API to read out the rendered color of those links. Again, not anything any of the designers of these APIs ever intended to have happen. But as we keep seeing, where there's a will, there's a way. And the more sophisticated and complex we make our browsers, the more, you know, they they become little like touring complete systems that can do all kinds of unexpected and unintended things. Anyway, in their abstract, they wrote, our results show that for a major so, okay, so just backing up, 368,000 plus internet users visited this history detection demo website, which sucked essentially and effectively sucked the browsing history out of their web browser, which is not supposed to be available to sites you visit, right? That's none of their business, but again, can be done. They said, our results show that for a majority of users, 69%, the browsing history is unique and that users for whom we could detect at least four visited websites were uniquely identified by their histories in 97% of cases. Okay, in other words, where we steer our browsers is surprisingly unique. And, you know, I know my own browser use. Yeah, I'm, I go to a few sites that, you know, like like DigiKey and DigiCert that, you know, lots of other people are not going to be going to directly. So I can see that. They said, we observe a significant rate of stability in browser history fingerprints for repeat visitors. 38% of fingerprints are identical over time and differing ones were correlated with original history content indicating static browsing preferences. We report a striking result that it is enough to test for a small number of pages in order to both enumerate users' interests and perform an efficient and unique behavioral fingerprint. We show that testing 50 web pages is enough to fingerprint 42% of users in our database, increasing to 70% with 500 web page tests. Finally, we show that indirect history data, such as information about categories of visited websites, can also be effective in fingerprinting users. And that's so sort of like taking a meta uh, view of websites, classifying similar websites, and then using that as the fingerprint, that's also effective. 
to fingerprint users, and that similar fingerprinting can be performed by common script providers. Again, similar fingerprinting can be performed by common script providers such as Google or Facebook. Hmm. Okay, so in other words, uh huh, uh huh. Hmm. It's not just cookies and it's not just, you know, obvious things. In other words, this introduces another entire category of tracking signal and or tracking reacquisition in the event of third-party cookie blocking or deliberate cookie deletion. Our browser histories turn out to serve as a surprisingly powerful disambiguator. That makes sense. Yep. And as I yeah, it does make sense. And as I mentioned, that research was followed up on and recently updated by a three-person team at Mozilla. Their Usenix paper from a couple weeks ago was titled Replication, Why We Still Can't Browse in Peace on the Uniqueness and Reidentifiability of Web Browser Histories. And they explained their work and their findings uh, a little more briefly as follows. They said, we examine the threat to individuals' privacy based on the feasibility of re-identifying users through distinctive profiles of their browsing history visible to websites and third parties. Again, that's the key, visible to websites and third parties. They said this work replicates and extends the 2012 paper, Why Johnny Can't Browse in Peace, on the uniqueness of web browsing history patterns. The original work demonstrated that browsing profiles are highly distinctive and stable. We reproduce those results and extend the original work to detail the privacy risk posed by the aggregation of browsing histories. Our data set consists of two weeks of browsing data from about 52,000 Firefox user volunteers. Our work replicates the original paper's core findings by identifying 48,919. Now remember, out of 52,000, 48,000, almost 49,000, not 48,919, distinct browsing profiles of which 99% are unique. High uniqueness holds even when histories are truncated to just 100 top sites. Wow. We then, uh-huh. This is really not surprising, we then find, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, Leo. I mean, when what's surprising is it, that they like, can read it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's what's annoying. <laughs> uh-huh. Exactly. Of course, if you have it, we, you could make it. It's probably very unique. Yep. 100%. We then find that for users who visited 50 or more distinct domains in the two-week data collection period, about 50% can be re-identified using the top 10,000 sites. Re-identifiability rose to over 80% for users that browsed 150 or more distinct domains. Finally, we observe numerous, uh, so basically, what, what that's saying is that if, if, if in a short period of time not many total domains were visited, that is, some people just didn't ro roam broadly, then there just isn't enough right. uh, virtual yeah. uniqueness, yes, right. in order to identify them. But if, 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 that's, if a person tends to roam around a lot more to, for example, visit 150 different distinct domains – then they become much more 80% re-identifiable. Right. And they said, finally, we observe numerous third parties pervasive enough to gather web histories sufficient to leverage browsing history as an identifier. Um, uh, we knew that, you know, so I remember word. when we talked about how Google was doing the work of God by taking uh, third-party tracking cookies out of Chrome finally. Uh-huh. But we, we surmised at that time, that's only because they have a better way of fingerprinting you. And, yep. and they don't want the amateurs doing it. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> Let us fingerprint users. And of course, and this so, proves oh, it. So, yes. So exactly. The, the overt privacy problem of cookies that everyone looks at turns out to be like, eh, okay, fine. Block them. We don't care. And you'll notice that DNT didn't go anywhere because it didn't specify how you track. Just please don't. And so it's like, ah, no, we don't really want to do that. We don't want people to, we don't want to have to honor someone saying, don't track me because we'll, we'll just say, oh, okay, wouldn't, wouldn't you like those cookies removed? Yeah, we'll, 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 ha we'll scrape those off for you. So uh, it is discouraging. There are two ways that our histories can be obtained. They can be obtained by sucking them out of our browser for which the technology exists. All of these different entities, oh, Leo, uh, I've discovered a creepy site called doubleverify.com. If you go to doubleverify.com and just sort of, this is one of the people, okay. one of those that we sometimes see, they, they tend to stay in the shadows. They don't like to be seen, but I, I picked up on them when I was doing this research about what sites are there doing this behind our backs. It is a super slick looking site, and it's, but it's a little bit creepy when, you know, you sort of understand that that these are the people who are who are putting little script snippets in ads and on websites. But they're, but they're in the business of trust, Steve. Oh, oh, I, I missed that, Leo. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see where it said that. <laughs> how could they uh -huh. be? How could they be bad? How could they be bad? Oh. By the way, this stupid accept cookies pop up, of course. Now we know <laughs> that's meaningless. <laughs> yeah, sure. Whatevs. Go ahead. Put cookies yeah, on that'll, there. That'll, that'll, that'll keep stop them, them pacified. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of this uh, in the world. They call these tracking pixels. And uh, there's all sorts of ways to do this, even though, in fact, a lot of them are not pixels anymore. It's just kind of that's how they used to do it. Right. They drop little bits of script now. Yeah. And they're able to do much, much more, more by. Yeah. yeah. It's very much like the Google Analytics that, you know, it's so useful for the website because Google tells you all kinds of cool stuff. But it's also Google running their own script on every single one of those pages out in the world. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that and an ISP monitoring our DNS queries. That's the other way you obtain browser histories is by looking at the DNS lookups that all of your clients are using. And so uh, another sort of little nudge toward uh, using uh, encrypted DNS in the future, which looks like it's, you know, it's where we're all headed. So anyway, I thought that was really, really interesting. I just wanted to put it on all of our listeners' radar that, uh, yes, uh, maybe it's worth flushing our browser histories. It's it's sad, too, because I really like the fact that my links are, you know, that like when, when I do a search for something that is like related to something I've searched for before, I see some that are, you know, purple, and I go, oh, I've you know I've already been in there. No need to go again. And and oh, Google's a little spooky because it'll say, oh, you were there three days ago. It's like, okay, yeah. Well, I am being <laughs> I'm being tracked. Well, you know, I also I know. I'm a little it's free. sympathetic. Everything's free, Leo. Yeah, it's I'm a little free, sympathetic. So. We do some a little bit of that ourselves. Um, if I, you know, to be in full disclosure. Because podcasts, you really can't do <laughs> tracking pixels, as you might imagine. But that's one. Remember, we were talking earlier about redirects. One of the redirects uh, goes through a company uh, called, I can't remember the name. I'll say Chartbeat. I can't remember. But it goes through a company that does an interesting thing. And I think this is the, our advertisers say, you've got to do something. So we don't do it for everybody. They have to pay for it. We don't. They don't get any information, which is the good news. But what happens is... Uh, this company gets uh, our uh, get uh, gets our effectively our logs. They get the redirects through them, so they track yep. the IP addresses. They store those of all the downloads, but they don't give them to anybody. We're very careful to make sure this is not uh, public information. Uh, it's the same stuff that we've been using. We send to PodTrack, it's the same exact stuff. And then they, if a company wants to contract with them for an ad campaign, let's say LastPass says, we want to see if this drove any traffic. Of course, we always use those URLs, but and we hope people will use them, but they're not 
the companies want to say, well, we don't know if we trust them. Most companies, uh, most of the uh, URLs tend to be Twit, even though, like, if I have a security now, people are still going to use Twit instead as the offer right. code. So right. everybody says, well, Twit works, even if they've never been on Twit. Um, they say, well, that's the one that works the best because everybody uses that. So you, you lose some credit. So what these, what will a company, if they want to do more informational tracking, will then put the tracking pixel from this company, a Chartable, I think, on their site. And then that redirects IP addresses of people visiting their site or their landing page to Chartable. And Chartable does a matchup. And without, uh, right. without sending IP address information to the advertiser... Or disclosing right. it, they say 82% of the people that visited your site in this three-week period also, also downloaded Security Now. Nice. So I consider that a relatively benign. We have to do something because advertisers are really, nowadays, I mean, look, we're competing against Facebook and Google who tell them everything, right? They know everything about you. Uh, we know nothing about you except for the fact that you downloaded that show. So I think this is a relatively benign way without disclosing any information about you to any third party. Uh, matching those IP addresses up gives them some knowledge about how successful their campaign was. And they, at this point, well, and, almost and have also to do bouncing that. through multiple redirects tends to be an anonymizing thing anyway. Right. I mean, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, we, 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 we bounce it through, I think, two redirects right now. One is uh, our own for counting. Because we, we we're trying to we charge people based on how many people listened, so we need to count that. That's a cost per thousand is how we work, and then we do this additional uh, charitable redirect so that people can. Uh, I think it's charitable. I hope I'm not saying the wrong name. We 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 looked. We went through three different companies to find one that really was, was privacy forward and would would do this respectably, and we think we found one. And I can't remember who it was, but gosh, I'm probably saying the wrong name. Anyway, this company matches it up without giving up any information of yours to anybody else. And I think that's benign, right? Yeah. Does it I sound think like that's as benign as it could be? Uh, yeah. Yep. I don't, we don't, re, we don't, the beauty of RSS, the reason Spotify is buying podcasts is because then you listen in their app. That's why they make them exclusive and they know everything about you. We don't know anything about you. We just know you downloaded the show. And all we know is the IP address you used when you downloaded it. That's it. And frankly, that's all we'd ever want to know. And I don't even want to know that much, but it's inevitable. That's how you count ad. You can't, you have to count unique IP addresses or you wouldn't know the downloads, right? Because very frequently, for instance, uh, you use Apple's podcast client. It'll open 10 straight, it'll download 10 different parts of the podcast at once. So, but is that 10 downloads? No, that's one. And so you yep. can't just count hits. So anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I want it in full disclosure. We do something like that, yeah. but I think we do it in a way that's as benign as possible. Anyway, and if you hate that, then uh, use VPN, Express VPN. <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> no one will know. It's completely up to you. Uh, Steve, once again, you have illuminated and uh, explicated and uh, pontificated. You've done all the aideds, <laughs> and uh, that means we're done. Uh, you can go to grc.com where he does not track you. You, I pre Do you even keep logs, web logs? Probably not, right? No, I don't have logs. Yeah. I don't have logging on. Nope. People, do, people think that their IP address is a super secret thing. It's every website you go to gets it. Obviously, they couldn't open a conversation. And most web server software by default logs, you would have to explicitly go to IIS and say, I don't want to know. Don't keep track. It's just filling up my hard drive with useless information. So go there. It's safe. GRC.com. You'll find lots of stuff there, including Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. If you buy 6.0 now, 6.1 is coming soon, and you'll be there. A free upgrade. Uh, he also does a lot of great free stuff, including all this vitamin stuff is there, the health stuff, if you want to see that. And uh, the podcast, 16 kilobit and 64 kilobit audio, plus, and it's unique to Steve's site, uh, transcripts really nicely done by uh, a, a human transcriber, Elaine Ferris, who does a great job with these. Uh, you'll get that, and she's doing it right now. She's type. Stop typing. Stop, Elaine. Stop type. <sighs> she also corrects my mistakes, which is really handy. Oh, that's handy. And I get, does I she leave out the ums and ah? Uh? 
<laughs> Probably I don't not. Remember. I, we discussed I see that some, a long time ago. I see ago. some I of those so. in there, you know, every once in a while. Uh, that's fine. Hey, we want a we want a record of the uh, show. It humanizes it. It's also really great for search because you can do a text search on it and find that part of the show very easily. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people like to read along while they listen. That's all at grc.com. We have 64 kilobit audio and video at our site, twit.tv slash sn. You can also subscribe in your favorite podcast app, a client. You can use Spotify if you want, but it's an RSS feed, so they don't. They, you can use anything you want, anything that'll take RSS feeds, and you'll automatically get it the minute it's available. Subscription's the best, because then you don't miss a single episode. If you want to watch us do it live, it's Tuesdays, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Uh, the live audio and video streams are at twit.tv slash live. Those go all day and all night. So you can always hear what's going on in the studio. A little uh, About an hour from now, it'll be all about Android coming up. Twit.tv slash live. Chat room, if you're watching or listening live, is irc.twit.tv. They're doing the same. Offline, we have a forum just like Steve does. That's our Twit community at www.twit.community. So that's for people who are listening asynchronously. Steve, have a wonderful week. And I'll see you Thank next you, time. my friend. Righto. Bye. Bye. Want more Twit? Check out Tech News Weekly, twit.tv slash TNW. Tech News Weekly is a show where Jason Howell and I bring the latest and greatest interviews to you from the people making and breaking the tech news. Twit.tv slash TNW. Security now.